So good morning everyone. My name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. So we are very, very happy today to be hosting Todd Dupuy. Todd has worked in the watershed restoration field for more than 20 years. He's a technical advisor for community-based watershed restoration projects and a lecturer of biology courses at University of Prince Edward Island. Todd is currently the executive director of the regional program with the Atlantic Salmon Federation and is based on Prince Edward Island. So uh, uh, just a few quick housekeeping matters for those of you who are new to this webinar series. Um, we're going to save questions for Todd until the very end of the presentation. To ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box that you should be seeing in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If that box is minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to make it larger. Um, if you are signed in with a headset and using the audio of your computer, you can raise your hand, which is the little yellow icon, has a green arrow on it, and we can unmute you at the end of the presentation. Um, so that you can ask a question, or you can simply type in your question on the control panel and I will read it aloud uh, for you to Todd. So I will now turn the webinar over to Todd. Thank you, Darla, and uh, thanks to the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute for hosting me. Uh, I think this is a great process. I did do a, a webinar last year and I have been online to look at some of the webinars uh, that were given in the past and they're great quality and uh, and I certainly enjoy doing that. Um, so we'll get right into it. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, my experience in uh, in Prince Edward Island. I'm actually parked in, in Charlottetown here, but I have some experience in some of the other Atlantic Canadian provinces with respect to uh, river restoration and fish passage, but today we're going to talk about, for the most part, uh, stuff that I've been involved in here. On PEI. So the first topic we're going to talk about is, is fish passage, and we're going to focus today on uh, trying to get fish up through uh, uh, through culverts. This is not uh, a picture from PEI, but it um, you know, shows you some of the issues that uh, fish can face. This is a particular uh, culvert that uh, that's what we call hung or perched. Uh, this is a, a particularly bad example, uh, but um, I'll go back here. Hmm, okay, we missed a missed a slide. Let me go back here, one here. Make sure I have the right uh, presentation on here. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're going to talk about really four issues when it comes to uh, culverts. One is uh, what we call perch culverts or hung culverts. The ones that have an excessive drop on the outlet of the of the culvert. Uh, some that have high velocity water within the culvert. So it's one thing to get the fish up to the culvert. It's another thing to get them uh, through the culvert. And often uh, some of these culverts have high velocities that fish uh, can't negotiate. Uh, some culverts have a uh, water depth problem, and water depth problem uh, usually means uh, shallow water. And uh, some of these culverts also have what we call rotted floors. So the first uh, first one that uh, we're going to look at is actually these, it's, it's perch culvert, also called hung culverts. This is an extreme example here. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, you know, fish are going to have a, a problem negotiating uh, passage through this culvert for two reasons, because it's uh, you have to jump a long way to get up in here, and secondly, uh, the water velocity in here is likely uh, too much for most fish that we uh, that we have here in, in Canada to negotiate. Uh, this is a, an extreme example. Uh, here's a, you know, more likely to see uh, examples like this. This is not PPI, by the way. This is uh, uh, two culverts on the St. Mary's River in in Nova Scotia, and these are what we call hung culverts or fish culverts. And uh, so we've got, you know, water drop of, uh, you know, you're looking at two two feet anyway uh, in both these cases, and that is enough, certainly enough to to block a lot of the fish species that uh, that would uh, be looking to migrate up into, into the spawning ground. So we'd be looking at brook trout or uh, rainbow smelt or, or gasparo species or even Atlantic salmon sometimes will have uh, have problems negotiating these, uh, these, these, uh, these perch culverts. Velocity barriers, as I mentioned before, is another uh, another issue. Um, I, I can't run video in this process because it doesn't work. But if you look closely, you, you can tell that this water is really ripping through these culverts. And this in this particular case here, the water is going uh, in this direction here, and it's going so fast. There's actually a standing wave here where the water actually kind of curls back on itself. 
Uh, and this is, you know, this culvert is probably 50 or so meters long. So that's a long stretch of water for, uh, for fishing to go shade bass water. The same situation here, you can see there's wet water here, and this, this is a longer culvert. And uh, so if the water is moving very fast, it's, a, it's certainly unnatural for, uh, for fish to negotiate uh, to, to, to uh, you know, to uh, come up into a river system and find water uh, moving this fast for a long distance uh, so they can't negotiate. Now often you can see these, uh, these culverts that have constrictions in them. Uh, actually what, what happens is as the water comes through the culvert, when it comes out the other side, it actually does a uh, what we call a, a counter current in both directions. So this is downstream of the culvert. If you stand looking down at the culvert, you'll notice that there's uh, debris and, and bubbles in the water that actually are doing a counter current on either side of, uh, of the culvert. And in high flow, what happens is that this counter current actually erodes the bank on either side of the culvert. So you get this big, wide pool, deep pool on the downstream side of the culvert. We call them culvert onions. And when you see them, uh, you know uh, for certain that these things are hydro hydraulically undersized uh, for fish passage. And if you go onto Google Earth, Google Earth or any aerial uh, photography, you'll, you'll see them everywhere. And here's, here, this is the river that I live on here in PEI. It's the West River, and uh, this is the downstream portion of the culvert here. And you can see how, how wide the river is, and, and you know, the river really should be, should, be, uh, should be this big. And what's happening is the water's coming and ripping through the culvert and doing this uh, this counter current thing. It's actually eroding the bank. Another one down here. This is a this is a, a big pond here. The water's going in this direction, but you'll notice below the bridge, uh, sorry, below the culvert, you'll see this big area here, which which we call a culvert onion. And look how big the river really should be down here. It's very narrow. So, and that's just basically a reflection of how much energy uh, is coming through the culvert in high flow. And the fact that the water is doing this back end, you can throw sticks in the water, you can see them doing this counter current, and that, uh, that causes uh, uh, the banks to erode. So when you see that, you know that uh, certainly this is a hydraulically undersized uh, for fish passage. It may be sized big enough to handle a 1 in 50 year rain event, uh, so the, well, the road won't wash out, uh, but certainly for fish passage, it's, it's undersized. Now the issue is um, in high flow and fast flow, um, these fish that we uh, that migrate up through rivers uh, are designed to negotiate this fast flow uh, because often uh, these this fast flow is, is is in amongst rocks. And if you see rapids or uh, what have you with, with a stony bottoms creek, often the water is actually actually as it comes down around the rock, it actually comes back on itself in both directions. Anybody that's doing any whitewater kayaking or whitewater canoeing knows this. Uh, that as the water comes around the stones, it actually will come back in itself and it creates a bit of a dead zone behind there. And fish, fish of course, know this. They can hide in amongst these rocks and uh, actually get a boost going upstream because the water is actually going upstream here. So what they do in, 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 in rapids, a uh, whitewater situation, they actually just go from rock to rock uh, instead of, you know, spending a lot of time swimming against the current, they just negotiate these fast flowing uh, areas by going from rock to rock where there's actually breaks in the current. And if you look at a, uh, a, a actual piece of, of, of white water, you, uh, what's happening here is that there's a certain proportion of that water that's actually moving upstream. So all these stones here are causing the water to come up and upstream here and vice versa here. So and and any given stretch of white water, there could be as much as twenty five or thirty percent of the water that's actually moving upstream. And that's really how fish negotiate uh, these these uh, these rapid areas. Unfortunately in culverts uh, when you have a fast flow like this you don't have any breaks in the current. So that's why these fish are having a hard time negotiating uh, getting up through these culverts. Another issue uh, which is not common is uh, is inadequate uh, water depth on PEI. And usually these culverts are undersized, but in this particular case, this culvert is, uh, is actually oversized. And as a result, in low flow in the summertime, we're getting dry areas here and very shallow water in the culvert. And uh, you know, in this particular case, uh, the water is coming down both sides of the culvert uh, you know, very fast. So there'll be a velocity barrier there and very shallow. So it would be difficult to fish uh, to, uh, to negotiate that fast flow. Uh, another issue: uh, a lot of the culverts of PEI are have um, have wooden floors, and these uh, culverts were uh, were built usually, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. We, often the floors are made of spruce. They are not treated, 
and uh, as a result, they have a limited lifespan. Usually, about 30 years or, or 35 years, they start to uh, start to rot. And whereas the water used to be on the surface of the of the floor of the culvert, that's now falling down and gets underneath the floorboards and causes some real issues with fish passage. If you look closely down here, you'll see that there's a there's a whole uh, school of rainbow smelt. These are rainbow smelt, uh, an anadromous fish on, on PEI that uh, come in from salt water into fresh water to lay their eggs. And of course, when they when they encounter something like uh, something like this, and this certainly would be a blockage uh, blockage to fish passage. So governments are often reluctant to uh, to replace these culverts because of uh, budgetary issues. If, unless unless the culvert is uh, is is going to wash out. Uh, often they're reluctant to replace them because it's quite exp expensive uh, to replace them. So we've come up with some solutions in the interim uh, while we're waiting for these culverts to be replaced. Uh, we've uh, come up with some possible solutions to try to assist fish getting up, um, up through culverts. So we'll start with the first one, uh, which is the perch culvert or the hung culvert problem. In this particular case, uh, we build what we call riffle, riffle building. So in this particular case, we've got a uh, got a waterfall coming out of the culvert that may be, who knows, uh, a foot or two high, and we want to reduce that uh, that outfall. And what we do is we build a couple of dams downstream. So what we do, we instead of an outfall of a couple of feet, we may have three or four of these uh, little ripple structures that are maybe six inches high, uh, which are uh, would provide for better uh, passage for for fish. And I'll give you an example here. So we have a culvert here. That has a it, that is perched. Uh, it may only be uh, you know 15 or 20 centimeters, but in a lot of cases, uh, if it's a non-salmonid, non-trout, non-non-salmon uh, non type of uh, fish, it, it's difficult for these things to these fish to negotiate. We're talking about you know uh, blueback herring. We're talking about uh, elwives or, or smelts. Uh, these fish are, are not as strong as some of the salmonid uh, species, and, and this this would be uh, enough for them to. Uh, to not get up into the culvert. So what we do is we, we often will build these ripple structures and, and instead of one big waterfall, we have two or three smaller waterfalls so they can negotiate uh, getting up into the culvert. This is an example. This is, a, it, it's, this is only about six or eight inches high. It's fairly close to salt water. It is an issue for smelts. So this is uh, the river that I live on here in, in PEI. So what we did is we, uh, we we actually built these ripple structures. This is just a shot of the culvert in the background. You see there's a bit of a waterfall. And we put in these big anchor stones uh, in place downstream. You'll see there's a difference in the head, head of water here. And uh, we in, in behind these anchor stones, we place smaller stones. So we're actually forcing the water to go up and over the structure as opposed to going through the rocks. And actually it causes a bit of a dam effect. And when you build a couple of these, uh, you can actually drown out the waterfall uh, so that fish can negotiate. So there's a before shot, there's an after shot of the same culvert. There's actually more than one of these uh, ripple structures. This is just one you see here, but there's two or three of these downstream. So what we basically did was to, instead of one big waterfall, we've got two or three of them. And that's the, then those fish are better able to negotiate uh, passage up to, uh, up to the culvert. Another one here, this is just a small structure. Uh, we only put one ripple structure in place. Uh, there was a, uh, an, this is an old, an old culvert, uh, the, the outfall out of the culvert was uh, about 6, uh, 15 centimeters higher than it is here, and it was causing problems for smelt skin up through. So we decided to build one structure, and you can see there's a difference in, in water level between here and there. We took about, oh, 10 or 12 centimeters out of this waterfall by creating this ripple structure down here. And these ripple structures are, uh, uh, fish are able to negotiate, negotiate getting up through there. So with these, and uh, we've reduced the outfall enough that fish can actually get into the culvert. Uh, here's another one. This is not a culvert, but it's an old dam site uh, and on Piscuit River in PEI. And this is an old concrete structure. It used to be an old mill dam for uh, running the sawmill that was removed years ago. But there was a sort of a remnant concrete structure you see here. Uh, it's about a three or maybe a four feet drop. And there's a pond up here. There's a private pond uh, above here, and uh, so this thing obviously is an issue for fish passage. Certainly, I know I know Atlantic salmon, uh, adult Atlantic salmon, are able to get up, but that's about it. Uh, the brook trout, uh, rainbow smelt, and gaspero uh, are often seen in the in the pool below here. This is only about a half a kilometer from salt water. 
So, and this this has been in place for uh, you know 60 or 70 years. So this has been a fish passage problem for many years. Now we could take it out, and we and we did take it out, but the landowner wanted to uh, wanted to retain uh, the pond uh, that was on this property. So we the compromise was we would take the uh, the dam out, and we would build a series of riffles, like I talked about earlier. There are actually four riffles in place here. Uh, that actually, that in step for, step fashion, allow the fish to get up into the pond. The pond is up here; you can't see it, uh, but the pond it remains in place. And instead of one big drop, we have uh, four or five drops. And this is what it looks like looking downstream, and they're just basically a series series of ripples that allow uh, fish to get up uh, in, in into the pond. And at the very top, this is this is the pond we talked about here. We want to retain, and at the very top, this is the last ripple you see here, and there's a, a net full of um, of rainbow snout. So for the first time in 60 or 70 years, rainbow snout are able to actually negotiate uh, getting up into the pond and up into the spawning ground. So if they pass rainbow snout, it'll pass anything. They're 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 about the weakest of the weak when it comes to fish passage. They're not very strong when it comes to swimming. And uh, often, if, if we have a fish passage problem close to salt water, we try to we try to design the structures to allow these uh, rainbow smelt uh, to get up. Because we know if, if rainbow smelt can get up, then the uh, the other species uh, that we're worried about, whether they're you know trout or gaspro, can uh, can negotiate. It's one thing to get. Um, fish up to the mouth of a culvert. It's another thing to get them through the culvert. And uh, often, if there's no breaks in the current within the culvert, then that will be a blockage in itself by way of either either the water's too shallow or, or the water's too fast. And so, uh, so the first order of business is getting to the getting them getting into the mouth of the culvert. The, the next order of business is getting in through the culvert. And often, you'll see these today. These are these are baffled uh, culverts. So we've got a uh, in this particular case, it's a concrete structure with a with a wooden bottom and they fasten these baffles. These are wooden baffles that are actually fastened to the floor of the culvert, and they they and they sort of act like stones uh, in that they break the current up and actually dam the water up, so uh, you don't have as shallow water. The water's a little deeper, and uh, they have you know breaks in the current in behind these uh, in behind these uh, structures to allow the fish to get up through. And uh, over here, you'll see. I haven't done this, by the way, but this is something I sort of stole off the net, but. In some cases, people have actually added stones uh, to uh, to these culverts to break the current to allow uh, these fish to get up through. Now, I haven't done this uh, on PEI, but in other areas, it is tried. Um, but uh, have it have it known that uh, when you add anything to a culvert, whether it's stone or whether it's uh, whether it's logs, you are actually reducing the capacity of that culvert to carry water. These things are usually uh, designed uh, you know, to carry a certain amount of water, usually a one in 50 year rain event. Uh, if, they were, if it was installed uh, you know, two or three decades ago, they were usually designed uh, to manage a one in 50 year rain event. And, but if you add, uh, add stones or, or, or logs, uh, you may only be reducing the, the, uh, the profile of the culvert by maybe you know, five percent, but you may be reducing the capacity of the culvert to uh, carry water by much higher, maybe twenty percent. As soon as you rough up the floor, it actually really reduces the, the culvert's capacity uh, to carry water. So keep that in mind if you're going to rough up the surface by putting stone in place or uh, or uh, baffles in place, that you are in fact reducing the culvert's capacity to uh, to carry water. And if it's already undersized, it's uh, in today a one in fifty a year rain event is not uncommon. If it's already undersized, you may want to talk to an engineer before you uh, before you do that. Another shot of baffles. This is uh, this is the one uh, the design that's more common in PEI with the uh, with a straight uh, structure on one side and, a, and, a, and a, an angled structure on the other side to uh, to do, do things in the water and uh, to break the current. So this is the one we we see most common in PEI. Here's one again that I haven't tried. Uh, this is a uh, Round concrete uh, culvert, and uh, they've actually embedded uh, these uh, these blocks in here. Um, um, I don't see why it wouldn't work. I haven't tried it. I will be trying it this summer in PEI. We're going to be putting uh, the wooden blocks on a wooden wooden bottom culvert here on PEI to try this out. But uh, it's just to give you an idea of some of the other techniques that maybe uh, may be applied, uh, other than just adding stone or adding uh, adding baffles. 
And of course, the solution for uh, for rotted floors is to replace the floors. And um, and uh, there's a number of uh, every year at PEI they they do you know five or ten of these. They actually go in and put new new spruce floors. And this is not perhaps the greatest example because uh, the water is uh, is very very shallow. But uh, in this particular case, this this floor was uh, was recently replaced. But as you can see, we've got other issues that go with the in, uh, water velocity and water depth issues. So we have to we have to think about resolving those. When it comes to uh, your replacing culverts, uh, bridges are, are definitely the best. Uh, here, here's a, this is before and after. There's, there's, a, uh, there's an old culvert here. This is a private uh, road crossing. And this gentleman has a culvert, and he's put everything in the world in here. There's a dryer vent. Uh, there's a, some sort of metal pipe, another pipe here. He's trying to increase the capacity of, uh, of this culvert because, because the road continues to wash out. Uh, so we went in this year with the watershed group uh, on the watershed that I live on, and actually took this structure out and put the, and put a actually a bridge in. Uh, so these these things are the best. Um, these if they're designed and, and sized properly, they they rarely cause any issues with uh, with fish passes. Be aware, be aware that you want to make sure that if you're building a bridge, you want to you want to usually put the bridge abutments uh, uh, roughly about bank full. So uh, make sure the bridge is very wide, um, you know, a lot wider than summer flow. In this particular case, it's almost at bank flow here. So make them wide. Uh, so spring, uh, you should know what your bank flow, bank flow width, it, width is, which is your spring flow width, and try to get your bridge abutments out in, into bank flow, and that, and that will not cause any erosion problems or fish passage problems. Another one here, this is, of course, our furry friends, uh, 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 beavers, uh, they, they love culverts because they're easy to block. And this is another one on the watershed that I live on. And uh, of course, when they when they block the culverts, you get you get uh, you know, uh, water going over top of the uh, top of the road, and has the potential to wash the road out. And obviously, there's some fish passage problems with uh, when you have a culvert that, that that looks like this. And the solution, of course, is another bridge. And this is another bridge. Uh, the design, like the one I showed you previously, and it was we just remove the culvert and. and Put, a, put the bridge abutments in place, and uh, we suspect we won't have any problems in the future with fish passage, and hopefully uh, with uh, with our furry friends. And of course, you have to know when to throw in the towel. When you look at the uh, you know culverts of, uh, of this you know, issues of this magnitude, I mean, there's no way you're going to uh, you're going to get fish up through here. So this this particular culvert should be put on the uh, on the list to uh, to be replaced. Uh, in this particular case, is a uh, a private crossing, and they've got uh, three culverts here, and there they're definitely undersized. You can see the the roads actually eroding out, which means the water is obviously in on high flow, and spring flow is going over top of the road. So this is a lost cause. Uh, so you know you should be looking at a bridge or at least culverts that are you know culvert capacity was, which is uh, quite a bit uh, bigger than this here. So uh, no one to throw in the towel. These things are not worth uh, working on. Uh, the, the ideal solution would be either a replacement or, or with, a, with a bigger culvert or, or a bridge. Culvert designs, the best ones are, are the, uh, the natural bottom ones you see here. So basically you've got uh, concrete uh, structures that uh, either a, an arch made of metal or concrete sits on. You have a natural bottom uh, substrate. Fish are designed you know, to, uh, to negotiate these the best. So these are the best. These are the uh, these one particular ones here often have a flat bottom, but it may not be a, it may not be a natural bottom. It may be a metal bottom or a concrete bottom or a wooden bottom. But at least you have the option to uh, to baffle the structure or put stones in place because because it's a flat surface. These are uh, the worst. So these are these are the cheapest to install, and these are usually the corrugated uh, metal ones. Um, cheap to build, cheap to uh, put in place. When it comes to fish passage, uh, these are certainly the worst. They, they tend to focus the water, and they give you little options uh, to get uh, to break the current uh, in, in the culvert. And uh, uh, I dread when I see these uh, these these ones putting in. Uh, just when you thought things were uh, were bad, they're now using these new culverts, which are some sort of plastic composite, and they're very smooth. And often you'll see a culvert that's uh, that's failing. They'll actually use these as inserts. So they'll slide this right in inside a uh, Corrugated uh, metal culvert, or use them as a new culvert, and they're and they're very they're they're very smooth compared to even the uh, the metal uh, corrugated uh, culverts. And 
as a as a fact as a result there there's no absolutely no breaks in the current so um, the, the smoother the air the, the worse the air for fish passage and even though they're a new design they're actually worse than even the, the metal court gate ones these are the best and if you're going to put a culvert in place make sure it's a natural bottom this is one here in Broodnell PEI and uh, basically what you're doing is you make sure that the culvert is big enough that it's at bank flow uh, a bank full on either side of the, of the brook and you just leave the uh, the river in a, in a natural state and uh, you can be assured that, uh, that you're going to have fish patches in this particular situation. Some of these culverts uh, do have uh, you know prefab inserts in them. Uh, they're basically fish ladders that are laid flat and uh, you know sometimes they're effective uh, and you know they're not as good at, at I wouldn't say they'd be as good as these but at least uh, there's some thought given to fish passage, and I've seen those used in New Brunswick, and, and this is actually on the PEI. But uh, if you had a choice, uh, that would be my choice. Now, when it comes to fish passage, you have to be strategic here. When you look at a particular watershed, uh, you, know, you, you should uh, you should do a survey of the water of the watershed culverts and determine which ones that are problematic, and map them out, and look at your budget. And uh, then, then go back and determine which ones are, are going to be going to uh, that are going to be priority. And the things you have to be aware of is that you have to have to be aware of two things: that you have to know what fish you have in your in your watershed. So some of these fish don't actually migrate very far up and in, up into the watershed. In this particular case, this is just a mock-up watershed that I put together here. Uh, salt water down here, so you're fairly close to salt water. And if you're dealing with rainbow smelt here, which is a fish, of course, that comes in from salt water and it needs fresh water to spawn. These particular fish don't actually migrate too far up into the watershed. The PEI, I've, I've not seen them any, any more than 10 kilometers above the tide. So if you're looking at a culvert way up on top of the watershed, it may be 20 or 30 or 40 kilometers upstream. Uh, you know, don't be worried about these fish. Even though these are the weak, weakest swimmers, uh, don't over-engineer your, uh, your fish passage uh, project here uh, so these fish can can get up because they're not going to get there anyway. So know how far, know what fish you have in your watershed, know how far they migrate up, and then design your fish passage project around that. Now looking at this particular watershed, if you look down here, the, the red stars are the ones uh, that show are, are poor passage. The green one, green ones are good passage, and, and the yellow ones would be uh, selective passage. Usually, uh, usually these ones uh, are, uh, you know, the selective passage means uh, the salmonids. So they, the brook trout or Atlantic salmon are, are able to negotiate, but the non salmonids the, the weaker, the weaker swimmers are, aren't able to negotiate. But if you don't have these non salmonids getting up uh, this high in the watershed, then you would just design uh, these uh, fish passage around around your salmonids. Uh, down here, we look down here. The, the obvious problem here would be this particular uh, tributary here, which is uh, close to the head of tide and it has a blockage here uh, for fish passage. So. If I were to pick one in this watershed, I would pick this particular one first because it's so close to the head of tide and it's actually blocking fish passage for a whole tributary. And I would focus my energies there. Some issues here, of course, with fish passage, but these are very high in, the, in these sub watersheds. So, uh, you know, I would, uh, even though there are issues with fish passage, what do you gain? You gain a little bit of, uh, a little bit of head water here, but it's not a big deal. So in my mind, uh, my energy would, would be, uh, would be, uh, expended on, on this particular fish passage project. So know your fish, know how far they migrate up into the system, and do your uh, culvert inventory and then prioritize those and uh, work on the, on the ones that are most problematic first. So just to, uh, to summarize, uh, when it comes to uh, road crossings, what makes for a, uh, for a good road crossing? Well, the natural substrate. This, these are two examples. There's a culvert and, and a bridge, and they both have uh, they both have natural stone in there, and that provides those breaks in the current that allows for better fish passage. Um, try to match the natural depth and velocity. So go upstream and go downstream and do your measurements and make sure that the uh, the, the opening is as wide as the river itself, uh, and that it's not too steep compared to what you would find upstream and downstream. And the velocities are the same. And of course, that uh, uh, that bank full uh, 1.2 times the natural bank width, which is bank full, that's important. So your 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 abutments uh, should be outside 
or at least act at 1.2 times natural bank width or for bank flow. And that, and that means in the, in the springtime that the water is able to get down through there without uh, uh, causing too much erosion or, or issues with fish passage. And of course, these open bottom ones, whether it's a bridge or uh, open bottom cul culverts, are, are preferred as they allow for natural bottoms and for, for, for more of a natural passage. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to talk about uh, sediment trapping and PEI. PEI has, has uh, if you don't know, has a real issue with with sedimentation. We live in a province with uh, where about one acre in five is in is in production, in, in agricultural production. Much of that production is in potato production, and as a result, uh, we've got you know extremely high erosion rates. Uh, on PEI, and, and it's not uncommon to get millions of tons of topsoil that wash off our fields and eventually, you know, find their way into our streams and rivers here in PEI. So this is a shot of a, of a potato field in the springtime of erosion coming off the field, of course, and it gets into a ditch, and that ditch drains into a brook, and eventually it finds its way into, into, into a river. This is not uncommon. This is a shot of PEI after a rainfall, and a lot of our rivers actually turn this color after heavy rainfall. The color of the chocolate milk. It's been happening uh, for, for for many decades, and as a result, we've got a you know, real major uh, load, bed load of uh, of sediment. You can see here what I mean. This is uh, looking down at the bottom of the stream. You can see, you can see as you see the uh, it looks like a beach. Actually, there's so much sediment down here that uh, it looks like Cavanese Beach. And uh, so the issue is we've got decades and decades of uh, sediment that has has dumped into the stream. So what a lot of the restoration crews, uh, the community groups that are charged with uh, restoring their, their rivers and watersheds they're doing is they're getting in there and they're actually, they're actually doing some stream clearing. So the idea is to take out a lot of the, uh, the deadfalls, a lot of the uh, large organic debris to help speed up the water. Uh, unfortunately, the forest and the PEI can cut two or three times and what, uh, what's left over is not the remnant of, of, of Acadian forest, and often you get a lot of older growth. You get uh, you know uh, vegetation that would not normally be there. You get a lot of uh, uh, organic debris, like you see here, that actually slows the water down. And in fact, it trapped. It's been trapping all the sediment that's been washing into our streams uh, uh, over the decades. Now the issue is, of course, once you remove this uh, lower, large organic debris, this stuff becomes mobile. The stuff that's been trapped there for uh, for decades now starts to move downstream. And if you're doing restoration work downstream, you certainly don't want uh, these uh, you know tons and tons of material to wash that wash downstream and fill in your pools or to fill in your estuary. So we looked at a couple of techniques uh, to actually trap that material, to intercept that material before it in fact gets downstream and ruin any any techniques or um, any efforts that you uh, you've done downstream. So this is a uh, this is what we call a bypass sediment basin. And this, some people think we're kind of crazy when we uh, when we pitch this one. And often, it's not easy uh, to convince uh, you know, the regulators, whether it's uh, fishers and oceans or or the provincial uh, uh, the province, uh, to to get a permit to do this. But we we've, we've been successful in the past in, in in building these things. And basically, what you're doing is you are building a large sediment basin that is beside the natural stream. So we have a natural stream here uh, with the water moving in this direction. And uh, so uh, before we go in and do our brush clearing uh, upstream, which as we know will mobilize uh, all that sediment and, and cause that sediment to wash, wash downstream, we build these what we call bypass sediment, sediment ponds. And so we dig them out. And the stream uh, here is actually running down into on the on the uh, on the tree line. You can't see, but it's trust me, it's it's down through here. So you dig the sediment basin out, and you put a diversion dam in place. The dam I'll show you is that is up here, and you divert the water into the sediment basin, and then eventually back into the uh, back into the original stream bed. So this this stream uh, bed goes dry because you divert the water in, and as the water uh, comes into the sediment basin. The sediment basin is so big that, the, the, of course, the water slows down. When the water slows down, it tends to drop its bed load, and it actually traps the sediment that's moving downstream into this into this big sediment basin. And what you do, uh, of course, is that when it fills up uh, with sediment, you have two options. You can just 
open up the diversion dam, let the water go through, and you just leave it be. It will it'll eventually just grow over, it will dewater because the water is now being diverted down through the original uh, channel, uh, and it will dewater and it will just grass over or uh, you can plant it. Or you can actually dig it out. Do you find that there's still more sediment coming downstream, and sometimes it takes two or three years for that sediment to move downstream? You can actually open up the open up the dam, let the water go through, and then use heavy machinery and dig out this uh, this material and truck it away or, or cast it aside. And when it's empty, you can uh, again re-divert the water through and, and to trap that sediment, so it doesn't get down into uh, into the lower reaches of the watershed. So this is. Uh, this is actually the same sediment basin. So we're looking at uh, down here as it's coming back into the into the uh, into the stream. We, we make sure it's well rocked and has enough uh, uh, rocks in place so it doesn't wash out. And the upper reaches, uh, the diversion uh, dam you see here, it's actually made of, uh, of uh, sandbags that are interlaced, and we actually covered them up with uh, filter fabric and put stone on it. And so the water is coming down from the river, and instead of going this way, uh, it's actually being diverted into the sediment basin. And so all that bed load gets uh, gets diverted into the sediment basin. There is a bit of a dip here. You'll see here in the in the dam structure, and if you get a crazy high event, maybe a 100-year storm, that it actually allows the water to go up and over and take some of the pressure off the uh, off the sediment basin. Another shot of one here. This is a different basin. This is the uh, unfinished uh, diversion dam here. The natural river is actually running down here. You can see it's not very big. I think it's only four meters wide. And this is a, this is a, this is the same sediment basin here. After one year, you can see the load, the bed load that's actually coming into the uh, into the sediment basin from from the uh, from the watershed above. They've actually, uh, I think, in this particular case, they cleared. Uh, four kilometers of stream uh, upstream here, and this is this bed load uh, has you know uh, has been in place for probably 50 years, and so the, the stream is very narrow for for uh, for uh, four meters wide and four kilometers, so not a not a big area, but this particular sediment basin has already uh, captured about 174 dump load uh, dump truck loads over three years. So this is a you know, and again, it's fill, uh, as I checked this year, it's actually filled again. So we're looking at a you know, probably 225 truckloads, tandem truckloads of material that was intercepted uh, by the sediment basin that would otherwise have been washed down in the, into the lower reaches of the watershed, uh, perhaps even into the estuary and filling the estuary. So that gives you a sense of how big the sediment issue is is on PEI. And how effective these uh, these structures can be. Okay, so that's one particular uh, method for trapping uh, sediment. Here's another one that uh, that's I would uh, I would say it's almost unique to PEI. I have seen it used in other regions, but not, not that often. And this is uh, what we call brush matting. And this is the brush mat you see here. This is a uh, you know this is a bunch of all basically what it is organic material that's laid down on the uh, on the inside of a uh, of a corner of a, of a stream. And it's really designed uh, to capture uh, sediment uh, during high flow, usually in spring flow, um, uh, as because that's what usually when the when the sediment is, is is moving. And the idea is here is that if you look at uh, the way water moves in any particular in any stream, the water on the outside of the bend moves faster versus the water on the inside of the bend. And as a result, the slower water on the inside tends to uh, deposit uh, deposit sediment. This is a, a deposition area. This is an erosion area. And what happens often, even in, even on a healthy stream, uh, the water is moving so fast on the outside bend, it tends to erode that outside bank. And the material that's eroded on the outside bank is often deposited on the opposite side, which is the slow side. It's called a point fire. And uh, you, can, you look at any river from, uh, you know, from space or from an aerial photo a photograph, you'll see these these point fires everywhere. So these rivers are constantly moving by eroding the outside of the bend and depositing that material on the inside. Uh, so the river isn't getting wider uh, because what's uh, what's eroded is deposited on the, on the inside. So that is the natural area of deposition, uh, and this, these are the areas where we actually uh, want to put these uh, put these brush mats. This is an aerial shot here, so you can see um, these erases here. 
the point bars. Uh, this is obviously not PEI, but uh, these are all the point bars I talked about on the inside of the corner, and this material is, uh, is uh, often the material that's been eroded from the opposite side of the bank, or in PEI, it could be material being washed downstream. So those are the areas you want to put these, uh, these brush mats in. So you you, uh, you basically what you do is uh, you uh, you have usually it's usually a sandy bank here and you, what you do is you just put uh, stakes in the ground like you see here and you just infill these uh, this area with uh, with either uh, you know, conifer trees or, or brush uh, and that actually slows down the water and actually traps uh, traps the uh, the sediment. Now a lot of people are concerned and say, well, are, are, you know, what, what, are the, what is there an issue with uh, with putting those in place? Because you actually may actually narrow the stream, causing some pressure on the opposite bank. Well, if, if it's uh, if you have a, an erosion problem like you have in PEI, often uh, what happens is the river actually is already wider. Uh, when you dump uh, tons of sediment in, in a particular river system, often what happens is the streams actually upgrade, meaning they get wider and, and shallower. So basically, when you're putting these stuff, uh, these uh, brush mats in place, you're actually not really narrowing the stream. Uh, you're actually narrowing the stream back to its original original width. So the gauge here, this is actually a um, a picture of uh, of, uh, of uh, the start of the uh, of a brush mat. This is the uh, this is the inside corner. This is the uh, the point bar we talked about. So the water is coming downstream in this direction here faster on the outside, slower on the inside. There, that's why that's why it's depositing this material. You see, there's stakes in the ground, uh, so they're staking out these one a little bit further out uh, beyond the uh, perimeter of the of the uh, of the point bar, and then they go in and they, they just drop in um, uh, brush, sometimes Christmas trees or, or conifers mostly. And they, and they and they tie twine. You see, there's twine uh, that are that are a matrix of twine that holds this uh, this material in place. Usually, it's layered or two or three layers in place. And then this is another one here. So there's your point bar. There's the finished product. This is the same stream, uh, 2007. And there's a before and after shot here. So you can see these things completely disappear. They just get uh, inundated with silt, and then and they grow grass. And uh, so you don't see them, and of course you see the difference in uh, in the substrate here. We got a very muddy stream on this side here, lots of sedimentation, and uh, a lot of the material we see has been trapped in, in here and gone back to what what we consider to be a rocky or ripply stru uh, uh, structure. Uh, another one here, before and after. Um, again, uh, on the inside corner, there's your brush mat uh, before. And I'm not sure how long after it looks like. Got to be two or three years after uh, after its construction. Again, you don't see it, and note note the difference in in the substrate here. We got uh, one that's 100% silted to sand it to one that's uh, very very rocky. So these things are are quite effective uh, in in trapping silt. Uh, the thing is, you have to be aware that you don't want to build them too far out into the stream because uh, sometimes they, if you, if you do build them too far out of the stream, they can actually cause some erosion on the opposite bank. Uh, but certainly a technique that's uh, that's being used to great effect here on PEI, and that of course traps a lot of material. It does two things: it actually perhaps brings the river back into a, a natural width, and it traps a lot of material uh, before it actually uh, migrates down into uh, the lower portions of the watershed, into perhaps areas that you've restored already, or into the estuary, uh, and, and uh, causes some problems with uh, with shellfish and, and, and other critters that live, uh, live down there. So that's it uh, for uh, for my talk, and now we'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. Thank you, Todd. That was absolutely excellent. So much good information in that presentation. That was terrific.